what we want to discuss right now is just a little topic called how, where did evil come from? Right? The source of, 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 of evil. And ultimately, what we're go, well, let me just backtrack one more second, is that we're talking about this nation called Midian and how it's different from all the other klippas because it's the general common denominator of klippa. What do all the klippas have in common is, who can answer? We spoke about it. They're masking. Yeah, they're Shows. masking. They have all in common their inability to unite, right? The, the, the basic agreement, like the, the, the common denominator is, is separation and, and like rejection of the other. And therefore, Kedusha, holiness, is defined by the opposite, by the integration of every single possible thing. Finding, there's, there's no, even Klippa has its role, right? And, and, and Kedusha is the idea of like organizing and every possible strand of reality into a seamless whole, right? And, 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 you, and, and therefore inter, finding the, the likeness inside of the other and the utility in, in, even in your opponent and how like really they work, everything works together. Whereas Klippa is basically a rejection. So we said, how does this translate into actual reality? It's something called Sinas China, right? In, inside of ourselves, this Klippa of mid, just like you have the seven attributes, which are really the seven nations, so you can name them. Your attribute of klippa, of chesed, of, is called the kanani. And your attribute of, of klippa called gevura is called the chiti. Right? So the seven nations are, are a parallel inside of us. We call our different seven midos, which are perverse, by the names of the seven uh, nations of Canaan. So we also have a midyan inside of us. And the midyan inside of us, another way of, of describing it is called sinas china. Right? It's, it's, it's your bizarre need to hate other people for no reason, particularly other Jews. And the idea is, people don't really realize that they have such a thing, but they do. And why do you have this? Because there's a general need on the part of the animal soul to just disconnect from everybody, to, to, to create quarrel and strife, in, in, in principle, intrinsically. And where does that come from? It's the source of all klippa. So now we're going to discuss a little bit on the board where did the source of all Klippa come from and why it's like that? And ultimately, we're going to try to answer a question, which is the leading question. We, we missed a few days of class, so I'm doing like a massive review here. Also, we have a few new people coming in. But the, the leading question we have is, there's division for the sake of unity, and there's division for the sake of division itself. Division for the sake of unity is a very positive and holy thing. It, it, it shows how we can break down things in order to find the true common denominator and come together. So if I can find a little bit of me in you, then I can unite with you. And in order to do that, I have to divide you into millions of parts until I find like some aspect of yourself which is, which is something like me. And therefore, that type of division unifies us. Whereas there's other types of division where you, you just are simply interested in dividing things, separating them. You're, I'm not dividing them in order to bring them back together again. Right? And so where does, since God is one and whole, where does this notion of just making separation for separation's sake come from? And I'm, tr I'm going to try not to draw this out too much. I just want to put some terms on the board and maybe a visual, because these are going to things that we're going to, I'm glad just about everybody's here. You're gonna, we're going to carry these through, and we're going to probably relate back to them quite a bit, so it's good if we know what they are. Starting from... The essence of all things is how I like to... A white board is, 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 is a perfect depiction of basically what we call the Orain Sof, right? This is be, beyond any description. This is the infinite light of God, which there is something beyond this board, which is the essence of God, which is before He shines His light, before there's any Orain Sof, the light of the Ain Sof, there's just the Ain Sof, right? But we're, we're, we're told that when Hashem like, began the operations, the light was already shining. And in a later stage, he's going to remove this light and create what's called the Tzimtzum. But in the, in the meantime, there is this infinite light shining, and there's something inside of this infinite light which is there in potential. Oftentimes, we describe this as the drop of water in the ocean, which is, if, if you try and find a drop of water in the ocean, you won't find it, right? It's in a state of non-being. It's one with the ocean. In theory, if you could take the drop out, you could say, well, it was also in the ocean before. But when it's in the ocean, it's in a state of, it's an existence, which is in a state of non-existence. And what we, we're going to put that as a little, well, this doesn't work at all, as like a little um, sort of dotted line where there is a 
drop of light inside the infinite light. And in that drop, you have the potentiality for the ten spheros. The idea is that all this is like an infinite p potentiality of spheros. Spheros be beyond the number ten. There's infinite numbers of spheros and there's infinite kinds of spheros that we can never even imagine what they are because our totality of imagination it comes from like the, 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 the box that we were made out of. It's from this little pool. So everything that's beyond that is just like godly powers that cannot even be, literally cannot even be imagined. Because imagination works in such a way that you're going you're gonna to sort of say like, give him some fish scales and like a leopard mouth. Like whatever you're going to imagine, it's already from a pool of things that you can, you can, you're putting together like components of things you can imagine. These are things that are imagine, unimaginable, right? And in the midst of that, Hashem has like this drop of ten spirits, which will be the eventual um, source of all the worlds. In, at this level, this is called the Esther Spheros Haganuzos. We're going to call them the ten hidden Sephiros. Why? Because they're hidden from their own selves, right? They're in a state of non existence completely. What happens next is Hashem removes the entirety of the light. You have a question? He removes the, all the light. So there's no, more, there's no more anything. There's not even the white, right? Everything turns black. And all the, all the light goes in, inside of Hashem and disappears completely. And he's now just Ein Sof without the Or Ein Sof shining, right? So this is what we call the Tzim Tzum HaRishon. It's a tremendous, you know, like act of, of, of Hashem disappearing, basically, and showing no revelation. And at that level, there's just nothing to talk about. It's essentially God's essence, which is indescribable and not shiny. Why does he do this? Because he's creating the scenario for the world to exist. He must remove all that infinite light if he wants there to be the presence of anything finite. All the infinite light is sort of in the way. So he removes the infinite light, and then what comes back is what we call the Kav, right? And he brings back that, that little dotted thing, which we called the Esther Spheros Agonuzos before, it al alone emerges, okay? The, all the rest of the light stays hidden, and that one little drop of infinite light emerges inside of the previously empty space, right? And that becomes the source of all reality. And what we say is that's like the beginning of what's going to be the Kav, right? This Kav is basically, the, it's like this, um, why I'm drawing it like this is because the, we're, we're going to soon see that the, 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 that drop of light, which is ten spheros, is going to exist in many dimensions, one after the next, each one with less and less power of light and, and more and more hidden to the point that the clippers will ultimately completely cover over every one of those ten spheres. But in their first presentation, the light is there without any clippers. Am I losing everybody? You have any questions so at this point? Before the creation of heavens and earth, there was, what, what did you call it, the ten hidden spheros? The yeah, we're, we're well before the creation of heaven. Hev real physical heavens and earth are like, are at the bottom of this Was this what you were talking about the other day with everything being infinite and in competition with each other? We're not there yet, but I'm going, that's what I'm trying to get to. I'm just okay. taking you from like the, the top down. Uh -huh. But at this point, do you have any, you understand what I'm saying so far? Do you have any questions on this matter? Uh, sort of. Yeah. Um, I, I'll keep listening. Though. Okay. This is, so just this like, is within the, the ten hidden spheros. So the ten hidden spheros and all the ocean that was surrounding it all disappears. And now you have an empty space called the Chalal or the Makam Panoi, empty space, and then just the ten hidden spheros emerge. The, the rest of the infinite ocean stays hidden, and the ten, hid, the ten spheros which were previously hidden, they stop being hidden now, and they come out of their hiding place, and they emerge, and, and they basically create like the, 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 the context of all things. It's like a beam of light which comes out. That's what this is intended to be, a beam of light. So, so the very first presence of those ten spheros starts... It, like, it starts over here, and it's called Adam Kadmon. This pen is not the right one for me. The whiteboard is the... Uh, is this... Soap, right? The whiteboard is the orange soap. And the ocean. It is the ocean, yeah. The dotted line is the drop. Inside the ocean. The ocean and the dotted line disappear. This is emerging. Now it's emerging. Right? And when it emerges, we don't call it anymore the ten hidden spheros, because they're not hidden anymore. We have a new, they're the same spheros, but we have a new name for them because they came out. And we call them Adam Kadmon. 
This is what we call the primordial man. Right? And why is it called man? Because those ten spheros are actually made in the image of you. Right? And when Hashem made his name, right, it says, Naisa Adam Kitzalmeni Kid Musenu. Let's make man in our image and in our form. What form does Hashem have? The ten spheros. And that's the image of man. So even though these are like the primordial worlds, we call them man at different levels of man. Primordial means like, I don't really know, that's a good question. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, primary, right? What precedes the beginning. Let's put it like that. Precedes the beginning, right? So, so now at that level, we also have another name, and this is going to come in handy. This is the names I want to discuss a little bit, which if you remember, first of all, like I said, everything's in the Torah, right? When you asked me before, is this information from the Zohar? I was sort of like, messing with you a little bit, but not, but, but telling you the truth. I said, really, it comes from the Chumash, right? Yeah. Because everything in Kabbalah, you can find straight up in the Torah. It's, it's all... This is in the Chumash. It's literally in the Chumash, believe it or not. No, I mean, what you're reading now is not Chumash. What you're reading now is something that was written in the 1900s. How is this from the Chumash? Because what I'm trying to tell you is that all this information is cloaked inside of the Torah. So you're saying, well, what, the ten hidden spheros and like the Adam Kadmon, I'm going to find this in the Chumash? Yes, by a different name, you're going to find it mamish written in the Chumash. And wh where do we find it in the Chumash? There's a story about Yaakov with Lavan, and they're playing with some sheep over there. They're having an argument about who gets the sheep and what kind of sheep and how to basically divide up their wages. And Yaakov at, the, at one point mentions that I'll take all the speckled and the spotted and, and you know, brown-colored sheep, and you take all the white ones, right? So the words that are used there right, are akudim, Nikudim and Barudim. Um, right? So, which is another, is, I don't have a great translation for these things. Bands, spots, and specks. Is it, yeah, I, th I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Bands, ban, bands, spots. So, bands, you mean stripes? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And speckles, right? I don't know what speckles. Is it with a C? Okay. Speckles, oh, yeah. right? Let's get rid of that guy. Shekels. Bands, spots, and speckles, right? Now, these names actually have real meaning in, in the Hebrew here. The word akudim comes from the word akeda, like when we bound Yitzchak on the altar, right? And the idea is that all... Now, this is synonymous with this. Adam Kadmon is also called akudim. If you want to get really technical in the Sfarim, they're, they're different things. But the way that they're oftentimes brought down in Hasidus is this way in order to make it clearer in our minds. There, there's subtle differences between them, but they're not important for our conversation right now. Right, so Ak and Aku, oh, very good. And Akudim, right, are, the, are synonymous. Now, now what, is, what is Adam Kadmon? So we just explained before, it's the ten spheros that were hidden inside the Orient Sof that first emerge. So that's why they're called Akudim, bound up together. Because really, there's no distinction at that point. Real separation of the spheros into different things hasn't happened. Just like when they were in the water, they were absolutely synonymous with the ocean. So not only was the drop in general synonymous with, with the ocean, but the 10 little spheros that were in that drop were all synonymous with each other and with the ocean. There was no separation. There was just a theoretical concept of 10 spheros, which all the 10 together were calling this drop. When they were inside the Orient Sof, they were all as one. So even when they come out, they're bound together. So the ten spheros are in one kli, which basically means that they're all synonymous with each other. If, you, if the ten spheros were each in their own kli, their own vessel, you could define each one independently because the vessel is what makes things different. Like, for example, you and my soul might be one, but when you put part into a body and this one into another body, now we're two. So it's the body which makes things divided from each other. So when there's no body, and all the little souls, the little ten spheres of light, are all in one body, they're indistinguishable from each other, right? So it's, for, first of all, it's a high level of divine light, but it's not exactly what Hashem wanted when He created His world, because He wanted a world like this, where everything's separate. So it's still on the process of getting down to the, the world that he, as He wanted it, right? But it's a, it's a step, because He's taken infinite, and He's like one more step towards making things finite. He's at least got those ten spheros separated from the ocean, all bound up in a little ball. It's the beginning of this giant stream of light, which is going to come down and ultimately make the world. 
You with me so far? Getting this? Talking about redemption or is this I didn't mention redemption. Okay, yeah, but although I should, we should always mention redemption. Okay. <laughs> redemption. Okay. Now, <laughs> now we go to stage two, which is the same ten spheros. The whole time it's going to be the same ten spheros, just going through a process, right? So now nekudim means spots. The what what was previously the ten spheros all in one vessel, right? which is basically a kudim. Now, the vessel disappears, and you have 10 spots. The, the, the 10 spheros actually come out and start to be independent from each other, right? So this is called the world of Adam Kadmo. I'm sorry, this is the world, the world of Nakudim. Another name for it, it's not an arrow, is Tohu. This is called the world of total confusion. Yep. Tohu vavohu. Why is the world of total confusion? Because all the spheros are just like spazzing out. They're all coming out for the first time as an independent thing, right? But because they're coming out from a previous state of total oneness, they're not even far from the orange soul from where they came. Each one of the individuals has an experience that it is the only one. Because when, it's, when, the, when, when all is one, the, the consciousness of every potential thing is that all is one. There is nothing else, which is a positive thing. Einod milvadu. All there is is God. So when, when, you're, when you're in the oneness, that's a healthy attitude because Einod milvadu. When Hashem has now delineated you into a private entity and you still are carrying the experience of Einod milvadu, so that's going to come into conflict with somebody else's feeling of Einod milvadu. So now at this, why is it called confusion? Because no kli can contain this. See here, every, all the lights are, are by divine force, like being forced into one vessel, and therefore their individuality is non-existent. When Hashem wants to now promote their individuality, now nothing can hold them, because each one is infinite in its own right, and is therefore going to come into conflict with something else, which is now being um, subdivided, but feeling infinite. So this is what we call chaos. When you try to fill in one vessel, and each thing that you're filling it with fills the whole thing, so the vessel explodes. And that is what we call the shattering of the vessels, which takes place at this stage, the confusion stage, leads to the shattering, shattering of the vessels. Right? Or we call shvirasa keilin. That is a direct result of the problem of nakudim or tohu. And this, my friends, is where Midian and evil gets off the ground. Why do you have, like, this, this is happening in some supernal world. It's not bothering anybody. But as we're going to go down to the next world, and there's actually going to be world after world after world after world until we get here, right? Hi. How you doing? We're going to get over here eventually, which is basically creation, after many, many, many contractions and toying around with this light. So these... These primordial realms, they have an imprint on what takes place over here. So even though in the realm of Nakudim itself, the fact that there's infinite powers all conflicting with each other in God's great world up there, where it's, it's not really bothering anybody, right? But when, that, when those shattered sparks, so to speak, fall and create a reality in our world, they come with the attitude of Tohu from whence they came. And this is where the animal comes from, which is that my animal wants to conquer the whole world, your animal wants to conquer the whole world, your animal wants to conquer, and when we're in a jungle, and everyone's fighting with each other to get to the top and willing to kill everyone in their way because I feel like I'm an infinite light, and yet I'm, I'm supposed to be in a, in a world with another person who feels like he's an infinite light, and this is basically the cause of all evil. The reason why we conflict with each other is because we have this attitude of tohu, which is basically left over from a feeling of like everything's one and therefore everything's mine because I, I'm both a private citizen and tinged with this experience of total like consumption of everything. So this is where evil comes from. And this is where the need for conflict comes from inside of every one of us naturally. We, from the standpoint of a tohu society, we all have a need to conflict with the other person before he even opens his mouth or says anything. Merely because he exists, he's already my opponent. Because that's my space. Everything about you is mine. Right? 
It includes non-Jews. Non-Jews really, in principle, define this in a certain sense. Right? When I'm talking about this attitude inside of a Jew, it's really the non-Jew in us. Because the non-Jew is, is, is in a state of perpetual conflict with each other. That's why they sort of need us to come to their town and like make unity. Right? The, the, the world at large is just constantly fighting with each other since the day it was born. The first man killed his brother. <laughs> right? Or the, for the first born man. Because he's like, what? There's a whole world and you want me to share it with you? Right? No, it's mine. Right? So this is like a, an, an ingrained into the human psyche. The only reason why Jews could be different is because we're going to get to the next level. Oh, uh, we're going to get to the next level, which is Barudim. This is where holiness comes from. So Hashem sort of realized, okay, I got a problem here. I'm not making a very good world in this, with this. So what I'm going to do now is take these dots, which in Tohu are just random, and I'm going to bring each dot to the four. I'm going to organize them in speckles, right? Which is basically the first time when you have what we call the normal configuration of the ten spheros. You want one more over there? You sure? Who knows what will happen? Do it. All right. <laughs> right? What about Keter? Keter also will throw it in there. But anyway, <laughs> the idea is that now you've got the same ten spheros. What's changed with them is that each one of them has taken a chill pill. Each one of them has now been separated from the source enough to realize that they, their, their finite power comes to an end at a certain point where the other guy's power begins. Instead of them feeling they take up the whole space, they have humbled themselves to realize they only take up their little space. I'll sleep in my bed. You can have your bed. And then they start to realize that they actually need each other. One is a hand. They're like, wait a second. You got, you got a brain. I got a foot. You got a heart. Let's put this whole thing together. And this is called Adam Ha'elion. Instead of Adam Kadmon, we call this Adam Ha'elion, the higher man. Right? Another word for Barudim is Atzilus. Why can't I make an arrow? Atzilus. This is the world of Atzilus. Or what we sometimes call the world of um, Tikkun, which means the world of correction. Right? Which, this is the world of confusion, and this world fixes that confusion and corrects it. And that's what we call the world of Atzilus, which is now the first of what we normally call the four worlds, right? So all this stuff we spoke about before was the primordial. It preceded the beginning. Now we have what we call the beginning of the four worlds, which is now one, two, three, four, Atzilus, Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya. You're saying Atzilus and Tikkun are the same? Yes, Atzilus and Tikkun are the same, right? This is also another way of saying Yud K Vav K. All right? So there's actually a, there's two levels of Yud K Vav K going on over here. Remember we had over here what the ten hidden spheros, right? Remember that? Because this was the beginning of our, when they came out. So this is one, two, three, four, which is also Yud K Vav K. And then the number four, it turns around and becomes the number one of another Yud K Vav K. And this is sometimes what we, what we read in the Torah yesterday. Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum Vachanu. Why do we say Hashem, Hashem? Because there's two dimensions of the name Hashem, right? Which is basically Yud Ke Vavke, starting with the ten hidden spheres going to Atzilus, and then Yud Ke Vavke going from Atzilus to the world of Asiya, right? And what is Yud Ke Vavke? It's the idea of being, developing, developing the realm of being. So each, okay, we can go far into that, but yeah. I don't know, the human is not. Um... Adam Kadmon? No, different thing. Um, so Adam, Adam Kadmon is, uh, represents uh, Atzilus Qualis? No, no, actually Atzilus Qualis is the ten hidden spheros. So Adam Kadmon would be Bria of Baklalus. So in other words, what he's saying right now, instead of saying one, two, three, four, which are like um, sim symbols of four different levels, you can also say Atzilus, Bria, Atzir, and Asiya. Those themselves are one, two, three, four. And which means you have an Atsilus, Bri, Yitzir, and Asiya. And then you have another Atsilus, Bri, Yitzir, and Asiya. Right? There's four worlds that are... keep. So there's, so there's what we call the four per private, particular worlds, and then the four general worlds. I don't know how the, in the spirit, the Keter, like the Malchus is the 
That's exactly right. This is what Atsilus is doing right there. Right? Now, let's just continue one more thing. Where does holiness come from? We've just discovered where Klippa comes from. Holiness was invented in the world of Atsilus. But now when these spheres all come together and they take formation, they all, that's called a rectification because each one is now a finite description of God which on its own would be almost like idol worship. You're going to take God and, and put him into a finite thing. That's not good. But if you put all the finite things together and with the totality of them, something emerges through all of them. This is the idea of basically when all the ten spheres comes together, which is another way of saying Hashem's name, then the name carries inside of it the soul of that name and you can actually contain God when the spheres come together and, and are configured. Or another way of saying that is a minion. Right? And you have 10 Jews, and we're like, instead of like each one of us trying to kill each other for who's gonna, whose base medrash this is, we're going to say, hey, I'll sit here, you sit there, we'll be a Kohen, a Levi, Yisrael, we got the whole thing, we'll all work together, and then Hashem can dwell with inside of us. And we're really trying to do that to the whole world, and also to the, to the seven nations of Canaan. Right? And like, we're, we're trying to make, so, so holiness and unity is, is part and parcel of when a, when a person stops needing to have everything, recognizes his finite nature of himself. Are you a man or are you a woman? Part of the idea that a man wants to be a woman and a woman wants to be a man today is a tohu attitude. It's like, I want, to, I want everything. Who says I'm a man? Don't put me in a pigeonhole, right? Who, sometime, now you got to the point where people are identifying as like a, a seahorse, right? Why do you say I'm a man? I'm a seahorse. Who are you to tell me? And they're, they're not crazy because in reality, everything is in everything else. There is an aspect of total, I'm everything. The, the, Olam not unbelievable. We say it even. The world, was, the whole world was put into my heart. But nonetheless, you have to come out of the tohu into the tikkun and realize you're in a, you are a particular thing. And your particular thing only can access the infinite when you connect with this guy's particular thing and this guy. We got to come together. We won't have everything unless we all partner up, man and woman. A uh, real marriage, man and woman, right? Creates children. The infinite resides there. So this is... These two levels, Tohu and Tikkun, have an imprint on what goes on down here. Your animal soul is essentially a, 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 a function of the Tohu energy having its way in this world, which is basically everything in reality, except for Jews, Torah, and holiness. And the world of Tikkun, it has an imprint. And that's when you follow the Torah. When you organize this world of craziness into the... Small packages, right? That's what bothers everybody. Why are, you why are you telling me what to do? Why is religion like, I have, to, I have to do this, I have to tie my shoes like this, I have to open the door like this, I have to put my mezuzah here, if I put it here, it's not. Like people get angry with all these rules. And then the rabbis from Chabad, they're, they're all saying, no, it's very spiritual, it's very spiritual. This is what they mean, right? You're basically taking the world and you're organizing it in accordance with the divine intelligence of where everything goes and you're making from crazy fixed and therefore, God dwells in the fix, like in this perfect building on Har, Har, Har Moria, in the Holy of Holies. There's like an emanation of divinity. And every Jew can have the Kodesh of Kedoshim in their brain, and their heart. This is basically how this is done. Until we ultimately have world takeover. But what does it mean world takeover as a Jew? It's, not the, it's the opposite of what everyone thinks world takeover is. It's all mine, right? No, world takeover as a Jew is like what King Solomon did. He tells everybody how to grow their crops, where their crops are best grown. He tells you what you need and how to fix your language. Like the Rebbe, he sends a shliach, not to say it's all mine, to take France and do best for France, to take Germany and do what's best for Germany, to, to basically strengthen everybody's individual and recognize their, their unification with the whole. And that's called Kedusha. So now we can answer our question from the beginning of class, even though we didn't even read one word. But let's read it inside. It'll help us. Okay? We'll finish this paragraph inside. So starting from page 8. We're going to do like a lot of words in a little time here. We've got five minutes, but it's all we need because we already described everything. You're going to go to the line that's like about 10 from the bottom. It starts with the word dechokma. You see that? Whoever has the... You want to get in there? Or we'll give it to someone else perhaps? So it says at the end of that line, there's a period, right? You see, it says, Kiyadua. Who's with me? We don't, you have to help us with more copies, I think, this time. 
<laughs> All right, we will. Kiddush yesh base mini his chalkus. There's two types of division. One bechinis his chalkus shegorim lasos period. One is a type of division which creates separation. Dafka kamo his chalkus akochos atzmim, and that is like the division of the essential powers. These powers, the ten spheros inside of akudim. When they, they're, they're called the essential powers. When they divide, i.e. they come out into confusion, when they come out of their shell, of their, of their world there, they go into a state of division, which creates total chaos and polarization. Right? So that's what he says here. The kochos atzmim, when they come out, shehem muchulakim be'etzim zem, they're essentially different from the other, because chesed is all chesed and has no gavur in it. Right? Each one thinks, I am everything. So they have, no, they have no connection with the other, right? They're purebred. And they don't want to mix their species into anybody else. The essential koach of chesed over here. And the essential koach of gavur over here. When they come out, they're, in, they're diametrically opposed to each other. And therefore, they're, they're, they're in a, a state of essential division from each other. So that's one type of dividing, bringing the powers out, which is dividing for the sake of dividing. It just makes them separate. If they will actually be revealed as they are inside, and they come out, they can't handle each other at all. And that's what tohu is. Right? <coughs> they're spheros that can't handle each other. The spheros reveal themselves as they are in their most simple, um, essential state. <coughs> as they were in Akudim, they come out in Akudim and they're in a state of total separation. They can't come together. <coughs> Therefore, they're opposite from each other and they oppose each other completely. And the second form of separation, open up base, his chalkus shegorim, his klalus dafka. That's this is going to be the second form of separation is over here, in Burudim. Is that I'm now? What do I do to get the spheros of confusion of tohu to all band up together and, 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 and get together? We're going to take each one and we're going to break it down into its parts, and we're going to say, you sphere of chesed of tohu, who thinks that you are a purebred, let me tell you something. You're not a purebred. In, because, because the truth is, where did you come from? You came from a place where you were one with all the other spheros. So somewhere inside of you is your opponent. And I'm going to divide you up into pieces and mellow you out and calm down your feeling of like total purity, this Aryan race. I say, no, you're a mutt just like me. And I'm going to break you down until I find me in you and you in me. And then we can come, first of all, the spheros get smaller less powerful, but they have the advantage of now being able to bind with each other. So that's a division for the sake of unity. When you take one thing and you divide it up into many parts, because when you have two things which you divided, right, their division is the, the cause of their separation. But when you have one thing and you, so to speak, self-divide, you like analyze one thing, that division is actually what causes it to be able to unite and you see every single individual part in every other single individual. So if you have two things and they're, they're, they're claiming themselves to be two things, the, the fact that the, 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 the division of them is what made them separate. But if you have one thing, like a pizza pie, and you divide it up into, into eight parts, you haven't basically made separation. You just clarified that there's like angles and different realities within your one circle, which can actually now all integrate with each other and sort of like play ball. So that's a division for the sake of unity. And that is the difference between Klippa and Kedusha. Klippa divides for division's sake. Holiness is also divides. And that's what we started this paragraph. If you remember, we said that like even in the mind, there's an element of division, right? In the heart, there's an element of division, but there's different functions for division. Some divide for the sake of being apart, klippa, and some divide for the sake of finding the common ground and unifying. And we'll finish this, so we'll finish this paragraph today, and we'll start tomorrow, chapter 6. Shukoyach. <coughs> yeah.